We are in the second week of Lent and using for a sermon series um, focusing on grief. Just notice in my work that a lot of people have been coming to me with grief, have been coming to me with kind of a just a sense of sadness around losing certain people and so thought with Lent and journeying toward the cross might be a good time to talk about grief. So this first part in the series is called A Time to Grieve. A Time to Grieve. In the Netflix original, The Girls at the Back, five friends shave their heads for the annual vacation because one has cancer. <clears throat> this one that has cancer will be going to chemotherapy and as a result will lose all of her hair. They have been friends since high school and they are super close. The first episode begins with each of them cutting off all their hair. Some of them put their hands through their hair before they apprehensively shave their heads. Others cry as they're cutting their hair off. They are shaving their heads out of solidarity with their one friend who is facing a larger than life battle. We do not know in the movie which one has cancer for most of the entire movie. When they travel, people look at them, some dare to ask questions, but they have sworn on this trip not to tell anyone who actually has the cancer. And so the question lingers over all of them, which one? While they travel every year, this year the C word hangs over them and they come to know themselves and they come to know each other more deeply as they cross things they want to do off their bucket list. You know, right behind the C word, not only in vocabulary, is the D word, death. On the list of things that turn our world upside down, right up there is death. The loss of someone who we really loved and felt emotionally connected to shakes us. Someone who was like just here is not here. The freshness of them can still be smelled in the air. Maybe even the words of Jamaica Kincaid resonate I didn't want to love one more thing that could make my heart break into a million little pieces at my feet. We close our eyes still in shock initially. In 1969, Kubler-Ross came out with the stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, in her book on death and dying. After interviewing over 200 terminally ill patients, she came up with these stages. One may not experience all of them or not in that order or maybe none of them at all. It's a lot and social scientists say it takes, it takes 18 to 24 months to begin the healing process. But the funeral is over, 18 to 24 months but my family went back home, 18 to 24 months. That's just the beginning. But my friends have stopped calling me, 18 to 24 months. But people expect me to be normal, 18 to 24 months to begin the process of healing. We make room for everything else in our life. We make room for joy. We make room for happiness. We make room for peace. We make room for more stuff in our house. We'll knock stuff off the table and say, like, here, I'm going to put this right here. We make room for special days. We make room for parties and celebrations. We make room for Super Bowls. We make room for concerts and orchestras, art exhibits and theater, culture, art. We make room for Zoom and hybrid meetings and in-person meetings. We make room for time with family. We make room for church sometimes, right? But we treat grief like we don't want it around. We are shocked when it acts out in us. When depression is on our shelf, we resent it. We self-medicate with all of the temptations of this world. But when they wear off, it's still there, asking for room, 
asking for our attention, needing our acknowledgement. This is where we enter the biblical text today. The ancient teacher, Koheleth, was willing to face the hard questions of life. And this text doesn't allow for easy solutions. You're not going to feel good today. Enter at your own discretion. Ecclesiastes is so contrary to the rest of the Bible that the early church debated about whether this book would actually be put in the Bible at all. It made it by the hair on its chinny chin chin trying to wrestle with what is the meaning of life. There is God and we are not God, little case or uppercase. We are finite beatings. To dust we return. Here today, gone tomorrow, yesterday a memory and tomorrow's a vision, but today, today is a gift. Be here for it all and live it in such a way that your memories are rich. Life is a gift from God. Be present. For it all. This reading today catalogs the various seasons of our life, 38 of them arranged in sharp contrast. Time to love, a time to hate, sharp contrast. And right up in there is a time to grieve, a time to mourn. Yes, happiness is in there, but so is grief. A little boy, not so little, a teenager loses his dad. The family is at the funeral. The 14-year-old gets caught up and begins to cry. He's really crying. He's really releasing his sorrow. After about five minutes of his crying, his uncle walks up and says, nephew man, I'm going to need you to man up. That is not making room for grief. Guess how long it's going to take us to get over our grief? The healing starts at what? 18 to 24 months. How long is it going to take us to get over it? That is not making room for grief. Man, you still stuck in the past? That is not making room for grief. Man, how long is she going to be sad about it? That is not making room for grief. This passage tells us there is a time for everything under the sun. There is a time for grief. There is a time for the rough side of the mountain. There is a time to cry me a river. There is a time for wading in the water. There is a time for sitting in the presence of pain. There is a time for swimming against the current. There is a time for leaning into the nitty gritty. There is a time when all you know to do is wail. There's a time under the sun for mourning. There's a time for stopping to address the mental and psychological hoarding in your life. There's a time for kids, regardless of race and gender, to cry for the loss of their parents. And we have to make time for grief. Do you have people you really, really love that are no longer here? Do you sometimes miss them? Did they make your life better? What do you miss about them? Is there anything you wish you could tell them? How often do you think about them? Grief is the evidence of how significant the relationship was. All grief is is an acknowledgement that you have loved someone and that person is gone and you feel their absence beyond words. All grief is you lost someone, and for real, for real, the sugar honey iced tea hurts. And sometimes on a clear blue sky day, it sneaks up and it grabs you from behind. Boom, I'm back. You don't see it coming sometimes. And just like that, you miss someone or something terribly and the weight of it throws you off balance. And that makes you 100% human. It's part of the journey. And if you aren't there now, you will be. Whenever you are there, make time for it. Grief asks for our attention, just like joy and happiness, and give others permission to. So the next time grief visits you, don't be quick to push it away. 
to ignore it, to respond by not responding, to put distance between you and it, because some days grief is like a foggy day. You step out and you can barely see anything. You know what is out there, but you can't see it. Sometimes grief can be so thick, you simply can't see anything else. So you may give it some boundaries, and you may give it a time limit, and you may say, hey, you can stay today, but you got to go tomorrow, but embrace the importance of that person or thing in your life. Some families make t-shirts, and they put the person on them, and on the back it says, rest in peace. Some people get tattoos on them of the person they're missing. One person took her mom's recipe book and is slowly working her way through cooking each recipe. Some put tombstones out with special words on them and make periodical visits with portable chairs and sit at graveyards to talk to the remains of the person. Some have planted a tree or donated to a cause that was important to the deceased person. Some sprinkle the ashes in places the deceased person asked them, like the ocean or a garden or by the house. But none of these stop grief. They simply accompany grief and maybe allow us to move on in spite of our grief. There are no shortcuts for grief. So when it visits, remember the words that there is a time for everything under the sun. And there is a time for grief. Martin Luther and Katharina von Bora had six kids. Their second child died in less than a year on December 10th, 1527. There was a plague and their second child, a girl, succumbed to it. Maybe with COVID, some of us can relate to that. Katharina talks about the grief that hit her after that loss. In 1542, another one of her daughters, 14 years old, became gravely sick. Katharina wept uncontrollably. She's like, I lost one child. This cannot, this absolutely cannot be happening to me again. That daughter did eventually die. Both her and Martin Luther found themselves in a thick fog of grief. Katharina, in anger, one day says, where was God? Where was God when our daughter died? And Martin Luther responds, the same place God was before our daughter died. Trust God who divided not the seasons up, but the chapters of our lives to experience everything under the sun. And we are here for it all. Each day is a gift. Sometimes the weather is too bad for us to see, but we can know it. God on both sides of our experience, before and after. Even if you cannot see God, God is still there. Whether we have faced something before and after, whether we're going to face something before and after, God is here for it all. Be present to this moment and this journey that Lent calls us to. Jesus was there for it all, modeling for us. He wasn't in a hurry. His disciples sometimes were trying to hurry him, but Jesus was like, ho, ho. He was present to everything under the sun, ranging from the celebration of a wedding to the death of a friend. So be here. Be here for the ride, the joy, the surprise, the twists and turns, the bumps, the struggles, the awe of God who has brought this diversity together today. And yes, finally, show up for grief. Sometimes and often the church is always just upbeat, upbeat, smile, be happy, come in, be exuberant. Our faith causes us to leap in the air. But there's a time for everything, everything under the sun. And there's a time for bumps. There's a time for struggle. There's a time for angst. There's a time for tears. And there's a time, there's a time under the sun for, for our groove, our grief. So let us make room for it. 
Amen. Let us pray. Dear God who knows our sorrow, thank you for being a God who's moved to tears. For in doing, you remind us that we can believe healing is coming and still make time for grief. Remind us that hope, that hope and grief are not mutually exclusive. We confess that we are sometimes threatened by grief. We rush to push it away from us. Grant us companions who are willing to remain with us in our sadness, that can hold space for our pain, that don't have to rush us to be well. Grant us companions that can sit with our tears and see them as sacred and courageous. Grant us this moment of not being quick to wipe away our pain and not holding our tears as prisoners. Our spirit aches sometimes. There are people that are with us and things and situations, and they're not here. And sometimes, Lord, we miss them. And whether we can see clearly or not, more often we can't. We trust you, God. The God that was there before and after. Amen.